I want to ask you why you think that Web3 has become such a big word and how would you even define it? Why people are so excited about Web3 and how people are changing their behaviors in Web3 versus Web2? Maybe before I, I talk about Web3, maybe we can talk about the problem that Web2 is or has introduced to this world. And so the internet and Web1, as we know it, in the 90s was created as, as a mean for communication. And it was completely open, completely decentralized. And um, when it was created, people wanted to give the individual the ability to communicate and be their own sovereign. Web2 came along and built on top of Web1, and corporate came and took that IP and, and, and basically started to uh, introduce better user experience, which is amazing. 2005, Twitter, Facebook, and many other companies. But at the same time, they started centralizing and basically creating those uh, platforms that were closed and basically permission-based. Um, and so the, the main problem that we see, and I see personally as a VC, is that Web2 is a threat to innovation. It's basically block startups to innovate and compete because those platforms, they control the distribution and they control everything. And so if you want to build on a common ground, on an equal footing ground, you cannot do so. And Web3 for us is the future because it allows decentralization. It basically takes those monopolies and break them and allow everyone, not just company or startups, even a person, a, person, a single individual, to own and to um, to do things on the internet. So if you think about Web 1 is read-only, Web 2 was read and write, then Web 3 is read, write, and own. You actually own and you're part of the internet that I think is kind of getting back to Web 1, the, the true vision of the internet. Basically what they explained is the reason why I think we're all convinced why Web 3, and it's kind of weird because Web 3 is just a term that probably started 18 months ago. <laughs> and before, it was just crypto and blockchain, right? <laughs> but uh, those are like bad words, right? And then somehow like VR and AR somehow became the word meta, right? And metaverse because of Facebook. So I think it's all conspiracy, but whatever. Um, going back to Web 1, I, mean, I, I grew up in Web 1. My first job was working for MC Hammer. If you guys know MC Hammer, remember, too legit to quit, can't touch this. Uh, but he was a venture capitalist, also a content creator. And, you know, he told me back in 1997, he was Jason, rich content, digital distribution, Hollywood's come to Silicon Valley, 1997, Okay. I had no insight that 20 years later, who owns Hollywood? It's not Hollywood. It's not Sony, Warner Brothers, Universal. It's Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. Uh, what we know as fame, right? The new super companies are tech giants. Um, going back to Web 1, it was about reading. Like I could you know, go on Netscape or I'd go on AOL or I could go on Google and Yahoo and get information and read. But in Web 2, 2004, 2005, you had YouTube, you had Facebook, you had now Instagram, these abilities to actually write or publish content, but where did all the value go? The value all went to these tech conglomerate giants that we just described. Facebook owns your data, has an advertising business. It is successful based on monthly active users, daily active users, and all of a sudden, the ones that got richer were not the users or the retail. It was these giant Mark Zuckerberg's are the new pharaohs, the new pharaohs of Egypt and the pyramids, right? The Jeff Bezos. So anyway, so going back to all that, for me, when I saw Web3 and what the NFT could do for a regular quote-unquote user, creator, or community, I was shocked. Um, and so around, I would say about a year and a half ago, there was a platform called Mirror.xyz. If you guys know Mirror, it's kind of like a blogger, Kickstarter for, for Web3. You can publish content, raise crypto to, for your project. But they funded a movie called the Ethereum Documentary. And it was, uh, the founder of Vitalik was a producer. Uh, it was an award-winning team. And they basically just said, hey, we're going to crowdfund this documentary about Ethereum and pay through token. And if you buy this NFT, you're going to own a piece of this documentary, and you could get a producer credit, executive producer credit, you get access to the film festival, whatever it might be. Uh, it sold out in 24 hours, um, and I think they raised something like over four or five million dollars in Ethereum. Okay, so when I saw that, I was as a filmmaker, I make films right for a living. Uh, I have a Hollywood studio called Stampede, and I was like, 
okay, this is interesting. Um, but it wasn't just like Kickstarter where you just donate and you get a wristband, right? You're actually <laughs> investing and getting equity in this IP, okay? So then Ashton Kutcher, the actor and investor, you know, I, I actually brought Ashton to China in 2013 when China's boom and consumer technology boom was happening. He's super smart, and I was not surprised. He had this cartoon series called Stoner Cats. I know we're in Korea, but in America, marijuana is legal in certain states, and it's this cartoon about cats that are smoking marijuana. It's like Rick and Morty. It's like Simpsons. It's like South Park, right? And in his mind, I think he was probably thinking, I can sell this to Netflix and get a check, but own nothing of it forever. Okay, so give you an example. Squid Game made over a billion U.S. dollars of subscription value for Netflix. And I think the creator of Squid Game got paid a few hundred thousand U.S. dollars. Never saw another dollar when Netflix made a billion. Okay, that's Web2. Netflix is a Web2 company, receives all the value, creates all of it for itself, owns your data, won't give it to anyone else. So when Ashton saw this, he was like, you know, forget that. Instead of selling to Netflix and owning nothing forever, this could be a billion-dollar franchise like Simpsons. I'm going to make 10,000 profile pictures of these cats smoking marijuana, see what happens. So he drops it, does a Discord, does a minting website, does a Twitter space. It sells out in 30 minutes. He makes over $10.2 million U.S. million in Ethereum in 30 minutes, fully owns Stoner Cats, the cartoon series, produces it, delivers it to the NFT community of thousands of holders, and now is deciding if he even wants to do a licensing deal mm. with Netflix or Amazon or Apple Plus, right? So I think to me, that's when the unlock happened. I'm like, holy, you can totally, completely own from beginning to end the idea all the way to the buying and transaction and the monetization, all the way to the community. So I'll end with this. Imagine if Star Wars was birthed not in 1982 or whatever, but it was birthed in 2022. And five years from now, there was 100 million Star Wars wallet addresses. Yeah. <laughs> what does that even mean, right? And I can airdrop you in the morning, hey, you're going to meet George Lucas on Saturday because you won this raffle because you own the Star Wars NFT. That is where the unlock, I think, is infinite and we haven't even seen yet.